Well, thank you again for coming. This is our last uh, series for the fall. We'll start again in uh, January, so look out for that after the holidays. But um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on introducing our panel. They are definitely alumni. We have Mr. Grady McQuaid from Coonanago. We have Marsha Greer from Delta. Kim Boozman from Coonanago. And Lydia Hall from Georgia Pacific. They all have a very good story to tell us. They all have some good lessons to learn. They're all in the early stages of their careers, which they're all moving up in their careers, which is a great, great thing to hear. And so I'm just going to go ahead and we're going to start with, uh, with Grady and we'll just run down there. And every time we switch speakers, we're going to do another drawing. Definitely questions and answers. We've got a program that will have plenty of time for Q&A. So uh, write down your questions because I know what it's like when you think about it and you forget it, okay? Unless you want them now, I want you to hold the questions until we do Q&A, okay? Because it'll be good. All right, Grady? All right, well, I'll kick this thing off. Uh, my name is Grady McQuaid. I'm currently the AOG and engine manager for, for, for the department of AOGs and engines at Noggle. I know most of you probably don't know what AOG stands for, so I'll elaborate. That's aircraft on ground. Basically, when you have an airline and they've got a plane that needs to fly, and it can't fly for whatever reason because, you know, parts are broken or whatever, wings fail, they call our department and they say, hey, we've got a spot, or we've got a, a broken plane, we need you to send a part from this place overseas, you know, Zurich, Switzerland, China, wherever. Uh, and we need it yesterday. So it's, it's very fast paced, uh, you know, Kudenagel is uh, mostly known for their ocean shipments which takes you know, two, three weeks of transit time. We're looking at 24 hours or less. So uh, on call 24-7, it's always fun. Uh, <laughs> but just to give you some backstory, so I graduated December of 2010 from Clayton State. I was uh, a marketing major, minor in finance, and hopefully, like none of you are doing, I waited until about November to start getting my resume out there, so it was a bad move on my part. Uh, so obviously, December came, I graduated, didn't have any job prospects, you know, getting a few interviews here and there, but nothing's panning out. Hmm? Oh, okay, sorry. So nothing's panning out, and then uh, finally I get a job with this company called uh, First American Credit Union in the illustrious field of door-to-door -door credit card processing sales on 100% commission. Fantastic job. I'd highly recommend it for all of two months, <laughs> which is as long as I lasted. Uh, after that... Fortunately, I had many friends from college, and through networking, I was able to land a job at Kunanago. Uh, so I started out on an account that basically managed uh, these machines that allowed you to that allowed doctors to uh, run tests on patients for new medicines. So we'd set up for trade shows. Uh, so we'd have to load up the trade show, get everything set up for the hotels break everything down afterwards and then distribute all these machines across the country. Did that for about two years, uh, got tired of it after a while, and then I moved over to our Delta account, which in, uh, at Kunanagel on the aerospace side, that's a very big account for us, uh, it's actually the largest account that we have. And I did that for all of about six months and then I moved over to the AOG desk as a supervisor, worked that for about a year, and then I moved up to the manager slot once that uh, opened up. And I've been in this position for about a year, and we'll see where things take me from there. Uh, I would definitely say, you know, things that I did that, that helped me move up as fast as I did was definitely network. I would highly recommend all of you to do that as much as possible because anytime there was an opportunity when my boss would say, hey, I'm going out to dinner with these customers, you know, do you guys want, do you want to come? Yes, every time. 
do you got, do you want to go uh, meet the president of you know our Atlanta branch? Yes, every time. Like, find a way to cancel your plans to continue to network within your company. If you if you have a company that you like, personally, I enjoy Kunanagel. I see me being there for a very long time. Uh, it's the company is based in Switzerland now. It's a German firm. We are in 100 countries, 60,000 employees worldwide. So there's a lot of room for growth, a lot of room for going anywhere in the world. I think we've got uh, like 70 or 80 offices in the, in the US alone. So and you can go to any state, basically, minus Hawaii and Alaska. Yeah, but who cares about that? Yeah, well, yeah, who cares about that? Um, you know, like I said, I got my job through networking. Actually, every promotion I've gotten was through networking. Um, so again, that's that's really the biggest thing that I can tell you to do. Uh, and then, as far as skills go, you know, being mul especially in today's society, you really need to be multifaceted. You need to kind of offer a whole package, but. Customer service is always going to be the biggest one, especially in today's society. You're always accessible through email. I was checking them the second, right before I started talking. I'll be checking them again as soon as I'm done. Uh, you know, so you really need to be accessible, uh, and you also need to have good oration written skills because, again, you're on emails all the time. You're always on the phone, or at least I'm always on the phone with people. I'm always on emails. That's just the nature of the beast today. Um, and I'm not, but in my sector, being multilingual is huge. Mm -hmm. So if you can learn a new language, if you thought about learning a new language, if you just kind of had it in the back of your mind for a while, just do it. It's going to be the biggest skill set, or one of the biggest things that you can, you can do for your development for a company. <clears throat> At least for an international company, if that's what you're interested in. Uh, and, and finally, problem solving. You'll really need to be able to think on your feet, especially if you want to succeed. Um, you know, and also, some of the lessons that I've learned over time is uh, going back to the, the problem solving, is like if you see something that you can do better, speak up. Because if you don't say anything, no one's, everyone's just going to stay with the status quo. And then you'll never get the credit for your idea. And you'll just keep thinking, man, we could have we done this a different way. Uh, and at the same time, like when you do speak up, you come to your boss with an idea, you, and then that gets escalated to their boss, and their boss eventually might not get credit for the idea. And that's fine. Because at the end of the day, as long as you continue to innovate, and you continue to bring new ideas to the table, they can't ignore that for long. Like, you know, you can get looked over once or twice, but if you bring four or five, six good ideas on how to make streamlined processes, eventually you'll get the credit that you deserve. Um, also, again, with today's society, make sure to get everything in writing. Uh, if Someone tell if you're on a phone discussion with someone and they say, like, oh, well, you know, I think that we can agree to these kind of terms or these rates and you don't get it in writing, well, it's not, it's not good. You're not going to be able to, to use that at a later date. So if you make your plans based around this information, it's bad information, basically. Um, <laughs> And, and for my side, because you know I'm a manager, one of the things that I would also recommend if you find yourself in a management field at one point is you know, if you've got tensions building up between team members, as, as I did when I came into the position I'm in now, uh, and you don't do anything about it, or you expect it'll just get better, or you think that things will improve over time, they won't. I mean, you really need to, to take the lead as, and obviously you're the manager, so you have to do this anyway. So, you know, you need to take the lead and really address the problem head on, right out of the gate. Because if you don't, there's not going to be uh, a 
nice outcome. You're probably going to lose employees. You're probably going to have divisions being created within the employees on people on certain sides. Um, yeah, that's never good. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, just uh, like I said, as long as you network, you should be able to find something. I mean, I, I know you guys all have at least one friend, right? I'm assuming. And they've got a job somewhere, hopefully. Hopefully one of your friends is employed. So, you know, I mean, that's what I did. One of my, one of my colleagues from school, you know, she was, she was working at KN. And I, uh, I'd been reaching out to her for months and months, saying, like, hey, I, I really need something, you know, out of college. And basically, painting walls with a college degree and that's not paying my bills, so what do you have? And then finally, you know, something came up. So, you know, that's really, I feel like that's, that's the biggest thing you can, you can accomplish, is learning how to utilize everyone around you to help build your career and build yourself. Okay, Thank you very much, Gregory. Okay. Hmm. Good evening. I'm really excited to be here, um, and especially in such good company um, with the other alumni. Um, I'm here to talk to you tonight. Uh, Dr. M gave us some different uh, topics to discuss, and I'm following that pretty closely, but also I just have some other things that I usually like to talk about when talking to students. Because um, there are things that, when I was in your shoes, I wondered about and didn't Either I didn't hear it said by somebody who was like working in a professional career, or I did, and it really meant a lot to me. So I try to pass those things on to you guys too, because maybe you're thinking the same thoughts that I did when I was in your shoes. Um, um, just so you know a little bit more about me, so that you help to understand where I'm coming from, is um, I graduated from Clayton State with a marketing degree in 2008. I worked at a company called Cooper Wiring Devices that's now owned by Eaton Corporation, if you've heard of them. Um, but I had an internship there first, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But I had an internship, and then when I graduated school, from school, I moved right into their accounting department, which was not my like mm -hmm. ideal career move. No offense to anyone in an accounting field. I'm sure it's fantastic and you love it a lot, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted. Um, and I always, what I did want was I always wanted to work at Delta Airlines. Um, I'm from Atlanta, but I also love aviation and all different facets of it. And I love the airline in general. So I knew that's where I wanted to be and I would knew I would get there at whatever cost. So I um, pretty much as soon as I graduated, I was even working at this other company for about two to three years. I kept applying at Delta because I knew that's where I wanted to be and I wasn't going to be satisfied until I got there. Um, I eventually got a role in the revenue management department and that's where I've been since. It will be five years in February and I'm on fire about it. I really enjoy revenue management. Um, and I, I just think it's a really fantastic fit, not only at Delta Airlines, but just in the specific team that I'm on. So if you want to talk more about that later, I'm happy to talk about it for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> I won't be here for hours tonight, but maybe we can start the conversation and then end it later. But um, anyway, so that's where I come from, just as far as um, figuring, I, I needed to figure out what I could do for Delta because I knew that's where I wanted to be. But it's very rare that you get to walk up to a company and say, I just want to work for you. Give me a job. And they just like they hand you a paycheck. So I knew that's where I wanted to be. And so I found out uh, you know, what kind of departments did they have that I would be interested in. And then how could I prepare myself for um, a role in that group. And so when I was at Cooper Wiring Devices, I actually was an intern in their pricing department, which is their version of revenue management. And then, like I said, I worked in accounting and then worked my way back to the pricing department. So when I was applying at Delta, um, and I did have some networking involved too to meet the right people to get my resume in the door. Um, but I, when I applied to their revenue management department, I had applicable experience. And that really helped out a lot for getting the interview. And then um, when I had the interview, one thing they ask is, you know, like they do in all interviews, but, you know, why do you want to work at Delta? And my response was, why wouldn't I want to work at Delta? Like, I really want to work here, and this is the only place I want to work. And then I told another interview person, another manager, that um, they said, 
I don't know what their question was, but I answered with, um, you know, if I don't get this job that I'm applying for, I'll just keep applying and I'll just keep <laughs> applying here until you give me a job. So the, the implication was you might as well just give me a job because I'm not going away. <laughs> um, but they gave me a job so they did, I didn't have to bother them anymore. So that was really fantastic. Um, but so those are the kinds of tips that I like to encourage students to think about is that you should really look for internships because that's experience that you can graduate with applicable experience already on your resume. In addition to that, if you get an internship and they like you and you do well, they will likely offer you a job. And that is the whole point of you being educated is so that you can at some point be employed. So besides the fact that it looks really awesome on your resume and it's just important for you to learn the side of applic applicable things while you're in school and have that when you exit, is it very often times can lead to some sort of employment that you wouldn't have had available to you if you hadn't already been working in the building. It's a really easy decision for a lot of managers to make if they've got you already sitting in the desk, they've already got you a name tag and an email address, and you're doing a good job, and they have a position, then they might as well hire you. So it just, it, it's, it's not ever a bad decision to have an internship. Um, I was actually paid during my internship, and it, it, they paid me more than I made at my part-time job before. And it was still part-time work. So a lot of people think that internships you know, are unpaid. Um, mine wasn't at all, and I actually don't know too many people that had an unpaid internship. You know, I'm sure they exist, and they're still valuable, and they can still lead to a job. But um, never assume that an internship is unpaid, because it can very likely be a very um, good situation all the way around. Um, Another thing I like to tell people about is networking. I know that Grady talked a lot about it, and I agreed with everything he said about it. Um, another thing that I didn't really understand when people talked about networking when I was in school is I always thought that like it was networking events. Like you had to go to like a convention, and that's where people networked, and they had like lunch together. I don't know how I thought that, but that's the idea I had in my head. Um, but when I realized later is that networking can actually and more often be the relationships you just have with people, and Grady touched on that, but it's just you know somebody who knows somebody, and you have a conversation with them about you have an interest in where they work, or you have an interest in their field, and then that leads to them having an opening later on, and you applying, and then passing on your resume. And um, it's not always, it doesn't always have to be like a formal, like, I'm networking with you and you shake hands. It's like just relational and that's, and you just, it grows out of the relationships that you very often already have. Um, so I don't know if any of you didn't know that, but that was eye opening for me when I was, when it actually worked out that way for me is I saw an opening and I, you know, knew somebody that knew somebody. So I just asked if I could talk to that person and that led to me getting a job eventually. And I was like, hey, I networked, you know? So it's eye-opening when you realize what the reality of things are. I think when you're in school, a lot of things seem very formal and maybe even theoretical, like you just don't really understand it. It's not a concrete thing. But then you actually do it, and you realize that you've done this thing that everyone keeps talking about. It's not nearly as scary or intimidating as it initially was. So I always thought that was pretty eye-opening. Um, something else that... I did not really know while I was in school is that marketing is the marketing degree I'm a marketing major is much more than advertising and sales you know when you hear marketing a lot of times you think ad campaigns and I wasn't very interested in that I was partially interested in it but um, the way that I got turned on to marketing while I was in school was actually with the marketing research class that Dr. Whiting um, led at the time and so I liked that it was kind of this merging of math and science and like a customer understanding and customer focus. It's kind of an art and science. Um, and that's what initially attracted me to marketing and that's actually what I do today. It's actually my new job that I've moved into is highly mathematical and it's highly theoretical math. Very, most people I work with have PhDs in mathematics. I do not. 
Um, but what, what I add to that team that's highly technical is the marketing, understanding the customer and understanding the business needs. And so um, very oftentimes you can actually bring a lot more to the table to a different group that you initially thought because you sometimes you would look at something and say, oh, that's all math, that's all technical, what can I contribute? But you have to realize that those, the people that are in those roles, while they might be superstars in mathematics and understanding all the theories, it might be actually very difficult for them to understand the business application and the customer side of things, which coming from, for me, coming with a marketing background, it just makes sense to me. It's common sense. And so I've been able to add a lot to the team that way. But I would say that as you're looking at um, different majors and things, you should just know the holistic view of the, the whole um, application of it, not just think the narrow-minded, you know, when you first hear about it. And let me see if I have anything else. Oh, obviously I'm very passionate about what I do. I think that served me very well in my career. And I would say that if you're currently in a job that you're not passionate about, you can, you can definitely, you need to be in that job and learn a lot about it and contribute to the team that you're on. But you should always be looking to something that you will be passionate about and you will care about because once you get into a role like that and you use the experience of things you've already learned, you're pretty much unstoppable. Like once you get into a job that really fires you up and you get excited about going to, then people notice that and they want to work with you and they want to promote you and they want to, you know, give you more work to do because you're just naturally interested in it and it gets you fired up and you want to get going. And I think everyone has something that interests them um, and so and you might think well that I can't make money doing that but if you're the only one that cares about it or you care about it so much that it sets you apart then you could definitely make money and you could definitely be successful doing it so that sounds very like pie in the sky but it's true if you actually are interested in something you should pursue it and everything else will just fall into place for you shoot for the moon yeah. Yeah. Is that it? That's it. No lessons learned. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you guys. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Kimberly. I work upstairs from Grady at Coronado. Um, I graduated December of 2013. Professor M. Lord Jesus. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't say anything. Um, <laughs> currently, wait. <laughs> I'm sorry, my friends tell me I do that all the time. I didn't know that I do that, but I do. So um, currently I am in a cell support position at Conanago. I have seven sales representatives that I currently support. Two of them are in Atlanta. One of them is in Huntsville, Alabama. <laughs> Three of them are in Memphis, Tennessee, and there's one in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So if you ever thought that email was antiquated and email is dead, no. Grady said, mentioned that early. He's always checking his email on his phone. It's constant. It is nonstop. But that's how you communicate. Um, that's how you, you know, do, do your work. Basically, do what you need to do. Um, I started my career path in supply chain back in 2005. I was basically thrown into a procurement position, assistant procurement position, and I had no clue what I was doing. And it was literally sink or swim. And it was one person in procurement and she needed help because we had a lot of locations. So I ended up loving the position, even though I had a very, very tough CFO who was on my neck every day, but she made sure that I knew what I was doing. We had triplicate copy purchase orders. Nothing in the system, triplicate copy purchase order. Everything you did had to go through a manual purchase order. So she taught me the value of checking, rechecking, and then checking again, making sure that all your, your T's and I's were dotted. So I fell in love with the, the, the feel at that point, but I was like, it has to be more to this. Like, so I started researching what procurement was all about. And then I started seeing this transportation and logistics and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, what is this? So then I was like, 
I need to go back to school so I, because I started researching how much those people made. <laughs> yeah, I need to go back to school to get a degree in that. So that's what I did. And at the time, I was still living in Chicago, so and I was considering a move to, to Georgia where my family was. And so I started looking at schools. And Georgia had Georgia Tech, had, um, what's that school in Savannah? Um, Savannah State. Georgia State, um, Georgia Southwestern, Savannah or Savannah State, yeah. Savannah State and Clayton State. Well, Georgia Tech was $100,000, $50,000 a year, so we weren't going to Georgia Tech. <laughs> and Savannah was like far from here, so I was like, we can't do that. So I was like, hmm, let me take a look at Clayton State, see what's going on. So they had an open house. I came out and I met Professor M, and we talked about, uh, I know he doesn't probably remember, but we talked about it. And I like made a beeline towards him because he was so engaging and so so just so refreshing about the field. I was like, okay, I need to talk to him. Mm -hmm. So when I, once I started in uh, June or May of 2012, it's been like nonstop. Everything about it just clicked for me. Like accounting, don't work. Statistics, crickets. It, it just, it, it just it, none of that made sense to me, but, but transportation and supply chain, it all made sense. So I'm like, okay, I know this is where I need to be, this is what I need to start doing, so that's what I did. So in August of 2013, um, with Professor M's help, I started working at Kunanago as a temp. And I talked to Jurgen, who is the big boss out there. I said, can I kind of make this into a internship? It was like I was there a week, <laughs> and I talked to the big boss about it. He was like, yeah, sure, no problem. So I'm like, cool, that was an extra class. Yeah, you know, I was going to have to graduate the, the following semester if I didn't do that. So I turned that into an internship and was getting paid for it. Amen. And, um, and it, was, it, was, it was great, and I love what I do. I love um, helping our customers understand supply chain. And I was talking to Marsha about it earlier. It was like... Your customers, they, a lot of them are clueless when it comes to logistics and supply chain. I'm like, you a director? I can have your job. Because they, like, they, they don't know what X works terms are. They don't know, you know, some people didn't even know what door to door was. And like Lydia was saying it early, she's like, think about it, door to door. What does that mean? <laughs> so it, it's, it's really, it's a really um, a fun feel. Um, I think another question that Professor M wanted us to kind of talk about was um, what could I have done differently to prepare myself for the job field? Well, I'm not a talker, believe it or not. And I'm actually kind of shy when it comes to talking to people and the networking and all that good stuff. But what they said is, no, seriously. <laughs> but what they said is so true. It is so important. And so when I went to my first um, supply chain conference in 2012, I met a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people. And it, I always tell this story. When you go to those types of conferences, you never know who's going to be there. One, because the conference is very expensive, like two, or $3,000. So you know big wigs are going to be there. So, but for students, it's about three, three fifty, something like that, three fifty or four hundred dollars. Anyway, so I went, and I remember wanting to go to two sessions that was at the same time, but I'm like, okay, I don't know which one to choose. So I went in this one session, and there was this older Caucasian gentleman. He had to be about sixty nine or seventy. He was just sitting there by himself. So I asked him. I said, um, I want to go in this other session over here. Could you take notes for me? in this session. He was like, sure, no problem. And so I'll take notes for you in the other session. So we exchanged, like, on your badges, you have this scan thing. You can scan it on your phone, and it'll bring up all that person's information. So I went into the next session, and I pulled up his information. Y'all, he was the vice president of Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wait, what now? Better get some good it, notes. It, I did. <laughs> And I shared them with him. And, you know, it was, it was a really cool meeting. I, I didn't want to go to Seattle, but, you know, hey, it, it was what it was. But that, that's what I'm saying. You never know who you're going to meet in this field. And it's something I talked to my, my niece and nephew about. This field is huge. Supply chain, I'm talking about. I don't know how many people are supply chain majors, but the field is 
wide open. Like it's starting to explode at this point. They're starting companies are starting to try to get a get a handle on their spending. So they need people who understand transportation and logistics costs. They need they need people who understand total landed costs. How much is it going to cost me to get it from China to my door and everything in between? So they need people who understand that. And one of the the lessons I would say that I learned um, being in the field now is that I I. I would I wouldn't say that I took my school for schooling for granted, but I know I could have done better in certain areas and learned more. So I would say that all the classes that you're having here totally going to prepare you. Well, for the most part, going to prepare you when you go into if you're going into logistics field or accounting field or whatever field you're going into. Learn as much as you can. So right now I'm in an MBA program and taking accounting, uh, managerial accounting. And, um, and, oh, so I understand that I totally have to understand what I'm doing because you know you have to make a B or better in every class. So now I'm getting an understanding, whereas before I'm like, I'm just doing enough to pass. So I wish I would have learned more then and then I wouldn't struggle now in in that particular course but um let's see oh finally um some soft skills that you you're definitely going to need definitely what these two guys are saying like communication is definitely key teamwork and collaborations are very important like how you're on um different teams here and you have to collaborate and do different group projects that's actually what you're going to do wherever you're going to go you're going to have to have that teamwork. Matter of fact, I just spoke with one of the managers at Kuninago and asking, you know, what is it that I can do better or do more of in order to move up and have, you know, different responsibilities in another position that I was definitely very interested in, but I didn't get it. He was saying, he said, come to me and see if there are special projects that our OCAM team is working on that you can help work on from start to finish so you can understand that analytical piece of what we do. He said, once you do that, you're in, you're in, it's gold. So that was very good information for him to tell me. And um, problem solving is huge. Your customers depend upon you. You are, you are like the face of the, co the company. So they depend on you to solve whatever issues that they're having. And if you can't solve them, they don't really think that you're good for anything. So even if you don't know the answer, pretend like you do, and then get the answer as soon as you can. So um, <laughs> I'll tell you, I do it all, every day. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, I think that's probably that's about it. it. Yeah. There's two stories that, that Kim's not telling you. One on the conference that Kim went to, I got at the very last minute oh, yeah. a contact of mine in London, academic person. He called me, he emailed me, he said, I cannot make the conference here in Atlanta. I'm willing to give my registration to a student, <coughs> that the student will go on my place on my ticket. And Kim just happened to walk by my office, and I said, what are you doing next week? And there she was. Now, she didn't say it, but she took scrupulous notes for this fellow, and he, she sent them to him, because that was part of the deal, was critique it, tell me what you got out of it. Very pro on his part, and she did a very fantastic job. And you communicate for about a year. Yeah, we still between do. Between him. We still do. The other thing, I had a project with Kuna Nagel, and it was uh, Jurgen and... and, and uh, and uh, Kai Hurst. Mm -hmm. They had a project, they had a sales issue where the salesmen were complaining that they couldn't go out and sell because they had paperwork to do. And so they came to me and said, how can we solve this problem on getting the sales people to stay out in the field and, and sell? I said to them, I said, they need to take the paperwork away from them and give the take the shield away so they don't have that as an excuse not to get out and sell. Put them out in the field and let somebody else do the paperwork i.e. Kim shows up. She got the internship, it was a new job, untested, unproven. She created the position as a temp and now she's doing it. So she won over the sales force. Reluctantly, they didn't want to give up that shield of excuse. And so it's working out pretty nicely. So uh, again, another, you know, another kudos for you and, and a feather in our cap and all that stuff. So anyway, you never know. Hello everyone, my name is Lydia Hall and um, 
I graduated from Clayton State in 2009. I initially was a um, business administration major, marketing, and how I stumbled upon supply chain was a lot of the classes that I had to take for uh, marketing, they were the same classes that you could take to get a um, supply chain minor. They didn't have the full supply chain program at that time. And I knew nothing about the supply chain. I just thought that it sounded pretty cool to have a minor attached to my undergrad degree. So I enrolled for the minor and it wasn't until I started taking those classes that my eyes really opened um, as far as the supply chain. I was one of those persons like um, the average. You have a need for an item, you go to the store, you go on the aisle that you need to get it on and you grab that item, pay for it and you're, you're home. All right, you go online, you uh, purchase, make a purchase and you just wait for it to arrive at your doorstep. Never did I think about the process of getting that that product to your doorstep or how did that product get on the shelf at the store. And it was when I started taking my supply chain classes that I learned that. I got those answers of how you know they move goods from point A to point B as, as him said, door, door to door. Um, and I was so intrigued with it that once I graduated, I was like, you know, I, I do want to go to grad school. I went to get my MBA and I majored uh, with a concentration in logistics supply chain. I moved to Dallas, Texas and I studied at the University of Dallas and I uh, finished my degree in 2012 and now I work for a company that is heavily in the supply chain. I work for Georgia Pacific, downtown Atlanta on Peachtree and for them I'm a regional sourcing analyst and I source goods for all of their business product divisions. So my projects that I mainly focus on, they have a spin up to like 10 million or more and how I landed that job, there's definitely a story there, but I didn't always work in the supply chain, although that was my passion. When I moved to Dallas, I needed a job to, to uh, sustain me while I was in grad school. And this company offered me a job in accounting. Never had done accounting. That wasn't, again, it wasn't my passion, but I took it because needed to pay the bills, it was good money, and, and in my mind I said, oh, you know, I'll do this job while I'm in school, and as soon as I'm done with school, I'm going to get this job into the supply chain uh, field. It didn't work like that. Uh, I was at this, this job, and closer to the time for me to graduate, I got a promotion, so I was like, oh, you know, I'll just stay another year. Well, one year ended up turning into two years, and I was like, you know, I have to get out of this field and move to where my passion was, which was, again, the supply chain. And how I ended here is, I'm sure you all have heard that say, is, it's not about what you know, but about who you know. And the person that I knew, my who, was Professor <laughs> M. I happened to be um, home visiting family, and I had been applying for jobs for the supply chain um, in Dallas, everywhere. And so while I was here, I even said, you know, maybe I should go look into a temp agency and see if they had any openings for a supply chain. I did that after a meeting with someone. I was on my way back to my relative's house and I said, I should see if Professor M is in the office today and go and make his day. You know, he has kept, kept in touch over the years. He'll see what you're doing. And so I dropped in to make his day and little did I know he would make mine. You know, we started talking and he's, he was asking me, what are you doing? Are you still in the county? you know you're not that, that accountant and I was like I know I'm trying to get out and um, he said well have you thought about Georgia Pacific I said you know I've researched them I think I've applied maybe but you know nothing came about and um, he told me well you know they've employed some of our students and so he worked with me to make my resume more marketable I know his touch now if I can see a resume I know when Professor M has his hands on that resume but he met, helped me to make my resume more marketable and he even went a step further and said, you know what, my contact that I have at, at George Pacific, I'll pass your resume on. And he did. And a week later, I received a call from GP HR saying, hey, we would like you to come in for an interview. <coughs> and because he put his name on the line to open up that door for me, I was determined that I was going to do the rest of the work to make sure that I got in. And I studied for my interview like I was studying for a college exam. I would get off of work. I'm pulling up um, 
the computer, I'm looking up behavior-based questioning, I'm writing bullet points, and that really did help me, that, that preparation, because the, it was a tedious process in the interviewing. Uh, three different, three separate interviews, but for each of them, I went in there with a high level of confidence. I knew that I was prepared, and everything that I wrote down to prepare myself, every question that I wrote down, they asked me every question. Believe it or not, I, I felt like, oh, am I just psychic? But they asked me every question, and I was ready to shoot off with an answer. And so, you know, that just, again, goes to show you that networking, I know all of us have said networking, but it really does pay off to network with different people. You know, he opened that door for me. And just think about yourself. If you were in the market for an automobile and you pull up uh, several different dealerships that are in your area that could get the car that you want, but then you have a friend that, that comes along and you say, hey, you know, I'm in the market for an uh, automobile. And they, they say, oh, what are you looking for? Well, you know, I know this person at this dealership. You can ask for this person. They can give you a good deal. I've worked with them. I was satisfied. What are you going to choose? Are you going to go back and just say, oh, let me pick the random person that I, that I see online? Or would you choose the dealership that your friend actually vouched and, and recommended to you? So, you know, somebody being able to vouch for you, that does go a long way. You know, that they personify those words that you have on your resume. They put those into an actual person and they're able to, to vouch for you and say that this person is a good person to, to hire at your company. Um, so definitely network, find mentors, people that you can just kind of pick their brains on what makes them successful. I still do that now at Georgia Pacific. I um, have people that I sit down with let me set up a meeting with you. You know, what is it that makes you successful? And I pick from different people to, you know, things that I can use in as far as my career and, and my goals. When I started at Georgia Pacific, I started back in March. I'm still new to Georgia Pacific. I started as a procurement associate. And I wasn't even there three months before they offered me the promotion to the job that I'm in now. I didn't have to apply for it. It was offered to me because I got in there and I showed them, hey, I'm here to work. I'm here to work and, and I'm going to work my butt off, you know, and, and it definitely paid off. And I now have my hands on a lot of things at GP. As um, Grady mentioned, don't say no, say yes. So things that I can volunteer to do at, at work, I do them. Um, I'm also a lead for college recruiting. And when we go out and we're recruiting at colleges, we're looking for students that show that leadership ability. You know, everybody won't run the company, but everybody has the ability to lead in your own roles and, and responsibility. You have that, that ability to do that. We look to see who's volunteering, who's doing community service, because that shows your initiative and your character. You're doing something that you're not getting paid to do, but you're volunteering your time. Um, who are the forward thinkers? Who has the ability to come in and want to solve problems or be innovative? Who's going to challenge the status quo? And one thing I do like about GP is that from the CEO on down, you have the right to respectfully challenge the status quo. If there's a business decision that you don't agree with and you're able to bring your ideas and show how you're creating value, more value with your ideas, definitely it's going to be taken into account and, and maybe even implemented. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to, to challenge the status quo. Uh, be able to effectively articulate yourself. Communication is definitely a key. Show you're a team player. And these are just some soft skills that you want to hone in on and, you know, definitely sharpen. Because, you know, your education or your technical skill may land you the interview. But it's your soft skills, your people skills, that's going to land you that job. So, you know, definitely... <laughs> Don't don't discredit, you know, your your social ability and, and, and things like that. You know, pay attention to those things and, and be good at them. Um, and if I would leave you with anything that I learned is be prepared. Like I said, I studied for my inter interview like I was studying an exam. Be prepared. You know, there are some questions that everybody's going to ask you. You know, some companies they're gonna throw out to you, what are your strengths and your weaknesses? We all can holler out what our strengths are, but when you're faced with what are your weaknesses, you know, we tend to shy away from that. 
And don't shy away from that question. That's not to, uh, Kim has a weakness, X by her name. That is, no one is perfect. So have you identified an area where you can improve? And if you have, what are you doing to improve? Your weakness may be public speaking. You may say, oh, I have a weakness of public speaking, but what I'm doing to work on that is, when I know I have to speak in front of a large crowd, I rehearse what I'm saying. I may sit my friends down and go over with them. Or your weakness may be, I'm not very organized. So what I do now is I carry a planner. I, I make sure that I log everything into my calendar. You know, it, it, it's something that you've identified as an area that you can improve on, and you are working to improve on that. Uh, most companies are asking behavior-based questions. Tell me of a time when. You know, have you ever been in a situation where, how did you handle it? Be able to articulate what the situation was, how you responded to it, and what was the result, because that's what they're looking for, if you can fully follow through with that. And again, network, have mentors, and although it may sound cliche, never give up. As Marcia said, you know, if you have a passion for a specific career, you know, it may take some time, be patient, but keep striving forward to get to the career that your heart desires. And that's it. That's my take there. Now, you want to hear the real story? She came to my office whining like anything. <laughs> I wanted to get back home. She went to a whole box of tissues. I mean, it was it was crazy. a whole box. You know what? He adds things in to make it sound better. So you know. Hey, by the way, these four people are trailblazers for us. They've set the bar pretty high, and expectations that their managers have called us and say, "I want more people like them." And we've been very lucky with all our alumni, especially these four. Kuna Nago is very very active with us. Georgia Pacific is very active with us. Delta has a lot of our students working there. So, I mean, these are good companies that are coming to us. They're calling us and saying, sending us more, sending more, which is great. So this is, this is what has been put out there as representation to Clayton State as the College of Business. So we're very proud of that, and I really appreciate that. Q&As, let's do some Q&As. First one has a good has to be a good question. Then we're going to draw. Okay, go ahead. Speak up so we can hear you. Um, hi, I am in my first semester um in the master's program um in the concentration of supply chain management. My bachelor's is in fashion merchandising. Um, but my career has been in retail for a number of years. So um, right now I am in visual merchandising leadership roles at Target right now. So I have a lot of um, experience in supply chain and logistics because I do it on a day-to-day -day basis and Target is a major company in regards to supply chain management. So I'm wondering, my question is how can I um, coincide the two with fashion and also the supply chain side of it? So. That's my you say you with Carter's? Target. 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 Yeah, Target. but I am looking at Carter's. You're with Target, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I work with Target, but I'm looking into Carter's later on, like by the time I graduate, because I know they're good in supply chain and also like Nike and H&M and Zara and all those um, international companies. So um, my question is, how do you think I can uh, relate the two? As far as a company, as far as a job, well, um, what would be the title of that? You know, I used to work at Nordstrom. I worked there too. And um, <laughs> buyers, mm -hmm. very good position. Um, I would definitely, you know, try to look at something like that, buyers in or in procurement, how um, she's in sourcing, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Absolutely, because you, you're involved in the beginning and in the ending stages you, you have to manage all that stuff in between so that's i mean it's de definitely a good i think that's a good combination you know what i'm saying so you, you know you could be the new face of getting what who's the name isaac Ms. ryan and all those people you know better exposure in target and i want to make one thing clear our offices at the college of business are always open for any of you who want to come and talk 
any anything, career pathways, all the faculty are willing to sit down and talk to you, but you gotta come to us and talk. All right, we're there to help you, we're here to give you guidance, okay? All right, we got a drawing here for the last mug. 069. 069, good number, 69. <laughs> no? Yeah. 69? Oh, okay, cool. All right, one more question, then we're gonna go. Because now, in, in your position, you, you don't have the, the work experience in the business field. But who could vouch for you that, oh, this is what she's doing in my class, and I think that she would be great for an internship with your company. Who are you networking with? Okay. That, that would be something that would be good. You know, what clubs around campus that are business related are you involved in? that you can network with. You know, you may not have the work experience, but I'm in these clubs and this is what we're doing. Showing on, showing belonging to something is very valuable. Companies know talent when they see it, regardless of what you've done career business-wise. Mm -hmm. They're looking for that outside of school scenario, volunteer, social work, belonging to something, leadership in the group that you belong to. All that stuff's very important. Now, I'm responsible for internships for College of Business. I don't find you internships, okay? I will guide you to the process and I'll help you be prepared. So if you want to see me, send me your email with times to meet and everything about internships, okay? Because they're starting to come about for 2016. But definitely, every one of them says, exercise and talk to people. Don't sit next to somebody in your class for a whole semester and not know who their name is. They are the ones who are going to get the job and pull you into the job. If they don't know you, they ain't going to think of you. That's the whole reason. You're in your own network right now. You're, you're in school to learn and also to build your future network because those are the people who get the jobs, who pull the other people in. It's networking. It doesn't have to be adults. It's peers. That's why they're here, to let you know what they've done so you can hear it. I can tell you, but I'm, you know, you don't listen to me. You gotta listen to me. <laughs> well, listen, thank you very much for coming. I know a lot of you gotta go to class. Thank you very much. Good hand for the crew. Thank you.